Well, it's been said that a way to a man's heart is through his stomach. This was a lesson in history first taught by Satan himself. He brought over Eve first. And you know, Genesis 3, 6, she saw the fruit. She saw it looked good. And she ate. Elohim was no longer her God. Her stomach was her God. And then she took it to Adam, and Adam failed to be the spiritual priest, prophet, and king in that relationship that he was created to be. And he followed his eyes and his stomach. <laughs> Literally, they ate themselves out of house and home. For they lost their home. They lost their house. They lost their place in Eden. All because something looked good to the flesh. All through the scriptures, we see areas like, of course, Israel, with their grumbling because they were hungry. God saved them, but that wasn't quite enough. They would have given anything to not be slinging mud in the pits of Egypt. And God rescued them miraculously, I might add, in ways that were so supernatural, there was no question they had favor with God above. But it only took a short amount of time where they were longing for the leeks and the onions and all the good food back in Egypt. And their hunger got them in trouble. Esau. Esau. A man who was by birth blessed. But he chose what his stomach wanted and what his eye saw as good over what God said was good. From the beginning, the enemy has come to tempt us and our weakness to appeal to the God of our stomach. Are you hungry? Hmm. Wow. Sean, how's that working for you? You're fine. You don't steak. Okay, well, let's go to the next picture. Okay, some good vegetables in there and potatoes. Is that better? See, this was what it was like for Esau. He was like, he was starving to the point where, like, he thought he was going to die. He wasn't going to die. And tomorrow when you get up and you're wanting waffles, don't worry. You're not going to die. You're going to be okay. You've made a covenant with God. When we can remove the picture, we'll be nice, Ty. I don't, he, Ty said, you're going to put that up? That's just mean. And of course, that's not the attempt to be mean, but to say, we, we see that. And what happens in your heart? I mean, I'll be honest, when Ty says, come over here and look at the pictures, is this good? And I looked at it, and I kind of like, you know, and Mike's like, you okay, Dave? And like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine, because I am a steak eater, <laughs> you know? But it's amazing how what we see and what we want connects to the king of our stomach to usurp the authority of the king of kings in our lives. And to think the original sin, this is how it began? Man, fasting must be really deeply spiritual in warfare. What do you think? It's not about losing weight. It's about losing your love for this world. Turn in your Bibles with me. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And if you need a Bible... Raise your hand. If 
you don't have one, you're not getting one in time, go ahead and look onto your neighbor's Bible. And look at this. Oh, the Apostle Paul says, verse 17, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. And whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Hallelujah. Oh, man. Paul says, hey, would you follow my example? As I'm walking and following the Lord, don't look at the Judaizers, those that are heretics and preaching Jesus one day and something anti-Christ the next day. Don't, don't look at them, what they're teaching, or their lives. Look at our lives and those who are following the apostles' lives because those who act like they're following Jesus, because Philippians is dealing with basically heretics and wolves in sheep's clothing in the church for a large part here. And, and he's saying, those people, they're actually enemies of the cross, and their God, their king, is their belly, their flesh. They love what feeds the flesh. Not so with you, child of God, because you recognize this world and all that this world is about is not who you are or what you're about. And we can easily get confused in regards to that, can't we? I think that's the warning that was given to Esau. I'll read to you. You don't need to turn there, but Hebrews 12, the scripture says, look carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Wow. A warning given to believers. That's an, that's an intense word, isn't it? Taking us right back to Genesis, the beginning of things. The importance of not giving in to what we see, what we desire. And I think that was the heart of the apostle of love, who you know this scripture, 1 John 2, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God lives forever. Hallelujah. This is the heart of a believer whose God is not his stomach or the lust of his eyes or the love for this world, but his love for his king of kings. Our heart is we want to get in touch with that more and more. And by fasting, by saying no to the flesh, by this incredible gift of an object lesson, a discipline that we have in the scriptures that we watched our king walk in, we're able to tune in to that heart of obedience that comes from the Holy Spirit. I am convinced that you will never find a Christian who is disciplined in fasting and yet living in a compromise. I've yet to meet one disciplined in fasting in, in the context of being born again. Let's make that part clear. But if they're really walking and worshiping that and self-control and saying no, I promise you when the enemy comes to tempt them with lust, with greed, because we have all kinds of hungers in our life, right? I mean, how often do you hear somebody come into some money and you hunger and jealousy? 
They got what for an inheritance? Are you kidding me? Oh, man, how come I don't have that? Gee whiz. Where did you go to dinner? Oh, man. What happened at work? You got a raise? Did you see the car they're driving? Did you see the purse she has? I couldn't afford a purse like that. There's just no way. And we've all got hungers from big things to little things, but they're all things. And they have nothing to do with who we are, our citizenship in heaven. They are distractions. They're distractions, you see. There's something that's appealing to us that, that the enemy wants to utilize. They can even be good things, things that are from God and they're gifts, but God wants us to worship him, not the gift. Satan wants us to invert that, you see. A spouse can be a gift from God, but you can make them an idol and be codependent on them instead of the Holy Spirit, and then that's cursed. It's not blessed. And all of a sudden, they're a bowl of soup, even though God gave you the bowl of soup. It's how the enemy works. When we fast, we say, my flesh shall not be on the throne of my life. One of the things I went through recently is I knew the Lord was calling me to talk to somebody about something. And it was a form of correction. And I knew I needed to talk to them about it. And I wanted to talk to them about it. But I kept hearing the Holy Spirit saying, no. Because if you talk to them now, you're talking to them out of frustration with them versus love for them. Don't talk to them right now. It didn't change what I was saying was true. It was just the heart has to be seasoned. It has to be right. Because whenever you talk to someone out of frustration with them versus love for them, it will not work out. Ever. But it was through a couple days of fasting with you guys and praying that my ear got more sensitive than it was than before. And I believe each time that we say no to the God of our stomach, that the sensitivity to the voice of the Holy Spirit becomes clear each time you do that. If you're someone here today and you're like, I'm fasting, this is my first fast. And by the way, who is it? It's the first time you've ever fasted before. Just raise your hand. One, two, three, three people. Awesome. That's awesome. And that just means you're going, man, I want to press in. I want to see the bar raised spiritually. I love it. I love it. And here's the thing. The more you press into that, the more keen your ear gets to God. Instead of hearing people say, yeah, the Lord was talking to me. And going, I wonder what that's like. You can be engaging in that kind of intimacy with God. And the more that you say no to your flesh, the less you love this world. By default, the more you will love God. They worked hand in hand together. We're fasting because we're God. We're going, God, we want to love this world less. We want to love us less. And we don't want to be on the throne of our life. We don't want our gut and our flesh and our desires thereof to rule our lives. And somehow we're going to take that and compartmentalize that with your will. That in large part is the Western church today. It's part of what God says in its word, but in his word, but the other part is what can we do that fulfills our desire for entertainment and success? And we see this mixture in the Western church today, and it's an Esau thing. There's a spirit, I want a spiritual blessing, but I want my bowl of soup. The Holy Spirit's not attracted to that. When we pray and fast, we seek God for clarity in such matters, and we say, Holy Spirit, I want to be a man, a woman, after your own heart. I want to shun evil. I want to walk in holiness, Hebrews 12, without which no one will see the Lord, the Scripture says. That's powerful, right? I mean, holiness is one of those things that if you really want to walk in, you will be persecuted, not by the world, by the church. You start walking in holiness, you'll get called a Pharisee. You'll get called legalistic. See, there was a day when I got saved back in the 80s, mid 80s, let me tell you what, early 80s actually, it was like, it, it was a different era. The, the church was different. You know, it, it, the worship was different. It really wasn't about entertainment. And, and, and it was just, the church was healthier, in my opinion. It was more about Jesus. What happened? It turned into a Broadway show. You know, and I'm not trying to get into a rant, guys. I'm just trying to say there's been this mixture, and we're lacking the discernment to see 
Now the enemies come into the camp because we're not fasting. We're not saying no to the God of our stomach. We're wanting to mix it together and have both. That's what Esau wanted. And when he tried to say, God, please let this, and even repented, it didn't work. You can go so far where you're just oblivious to the plight that you've walked in. It's, it's spiritual. And I want to share some truth with you tonight that I promised you last night I would about a man by the name of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, if you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Now you'll find that right after 1 Chronicles. And before the book of Ezra, I believe. This evil dictator within us, this king of our stomach, this flesh, these members within, Romans 7, that war against us, it's time to evict the dictator. Amen? And that's what we're doing when we're fasting. We're saying, no, I will make no provision for the flesh. If we were walking in that, we would not succumb to things on TV, on Netflix, ungodly conversations. We wouldn't find ourselves as a teenager looking at Beyonce and going, I know I'm a Christian, but I'm just amazed by the way she dresses and sings and wiggles and, 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 and Jay-Z and all this. And, and let me go to an Aerosmith concert because man, I just, you know, it, I know it's not Christian, but you know, it, it's just, it's cool. And okay, you can, but why play? <laughs> why, why play with the enemy is my thing. Now see, that kind of talk gets called legalistic. It does. But if you desire, if you like walking through landmines, have at it. I have no desire. If I know there's landmines, but most of the ground's okay to walk on, it's just a few spots that might kill you, I just don't want to go there at all. <laughs> Doesn't that make sense? Jehoshaphat was a man of God. He loved his king. Great king, really was. He started off in chapter 17, reigning, and man, he was cleaning house. Kind of like when we get saved. Man, I don't want to smoke cigarettes. I don't want to curse. I don't want to do this. And, 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 and you know, sadly, we do some of those things thinking somehow that's going to please God or make him love us more. We're ignorant to the grace of God. But, but our heart is we want to please dad. We want to be like dad, like any young child does. And Jehoshaphat, he starts off his walk, man, I'm going to walk holy before God. And the first thing he does is he tears down all the high places in Judah. He was king of Judah, all right? You had Judah, tribe of Benjamin, and you had the ten northern kingdoms in Israel, up like where Samaria is at today. And you had a different king, the divided kingdom. For some of you students of the Bible, they're still kind of learning that. So you had the lower part there of the continent, the country, I should say, where you had Jehoshaphat that reigned over these two kingdoms, these two tribes. And as the first thing in order of business, he comes and tears down all the, the idols of Baal and the Asherah poles and all those things that were grieving to God. He wants the nation to be holy. And it says there in chapter 17, he was used to bring peace back into the land where there was no peace. A man of God who took a stand for holiness and the beauty thereof, God saw that as an oracle, a vessel to move through and bring peace back. Beautiful. A picture of salvation, if you would. But then chapter 18, something happened to Jehoshaphat. He started to develop a friendship with King Ahab. Maybe you've heard of Ahab. He was, anybody remember his wife's name? Jezebel. I would highly recommend you never name your daughters Jezebel. Not a good name. Like, you don't name your son Judas. You don't name your daughter Jezebel, right? Jezebel, man, she was a manipulator, demonic to the T. It was incredible. But some, for some reason, Jehoshaphat was really impressed with Ahab and Jezebel and Jay-Z and Beyonce. <laughs> He was impressed. He was like, man, what talent. 
And he was impressed with the culture that they had because it was a bigger, I mean, 10 tribes, bigger geography. He was, you know, he's just a small king of Judah. This is Ahab, right? Mm. There was a hunger in Jehoshaphat, something he saw that he lusted with his eye, some ambition, maybe a fear from other nations and getting more protection, even if that meant selling integrity and conviction spiritually to covenant with Ahab, and he did, and he compromised. A prophet came and warned him in chapter 18, this is not the Lord. You're going to suffer destruction if you don't heed the word of the Lord. Did Jehoshaphat heed? No. Instead, he continued to covenant with Ahab, a picture of the world, right? Right? Now, this is someone who loves God, who's been anointed by God, but somehow the fruit looks desiring something you want to eat. And he gave in. He gave in. It was in chapter 19 that Ahab dies, as prophesied. Jehoshaphat was spared and got to get back, by the skin of his teeth, get back to Judah. And we pick up in chapter 20, verse 1. And it happened after this. What's after this? Everything I just told you and more. I would highly encourage you to open up your Bibles and read chapters 17 through 20 with the reign of Jehoshaphat. It is worthy of your time. After this, that the people of Moab and the people of Ammon, noteworthy who they are, these are descendants of, of the sons that were bore to Lot ancestrally through his two daughters after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a Bible study that we don't have time to get into. And of course, and it says, and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some of them came and told Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria and there he's on Tamar, which is an in Gedi. Let's stop there. Here we are. You know the storyline. A man who loved God, who got a hunger for an ambition for this world and gave in to his appetite and compromised. God spared him. Grace alone would be the reason for that, right? And now he's back in Judah, but now there's a problem. Now he is surrounded by his enemies, caught up in a spirit of fear. This is what happens to the child of God when we give in to the God of our stomach. And we want to compartmentalize and live a life of polygamy with our bridegroom of heaven and this world. You invite the enemy to surround you and bring fear upon you. Now, we might not have Ammonites or the Moabites, but we have demons. And whenever you start giving in to the flesh, you're basically serving up one of those steaks I showed you to some type of demonic presence saying, can I feed you, please? Can I invite you into my life? Every one of us in this room have done that, more than likely, on one level or another. And you're only still alive by the grace of God. How did we get there? The God of our stomach. The same way the original fall took place. The same way the Israelites grumbled. The same way Sodom and Gomorrah was known for a a nation of appetite. The same way Esau blew it. So... What do we do once we're there? There are some principles found in this chapter that I want to read to you that I pray tonight would just saturate your soul with truth, that you would hear this and it would grab you by your spiritual jugular tonight. You're sensitive to the Holy Spirit right now. You're listening to Him. You're heeding Him. Some of you have wept in conviction of sin because you really want to walk as Jesus walked. May the Holy Spirit make these relevant truths to you real tonight as we pick up in verse 3. It says, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah, 
far out. It wasn't just him fasting. He says, everybody that's part of this kingdom, it's not an option. We are all fasting. Some at Reveal Fellowship heard a call to fast and says, well, they can't make us fast. You're right, we can't. That's not the attempt. We're calling for a fast, whether you want to be obedient to that or not, right? And obviously, if you're here, you're being obedient. So for some of you that are checking in online because you really didn't want to do it, just something to pray about. (laughs) Why did Jehoshaphat do this? Because he saw the enemy was coming and he knew we've got to get serious. We've, We've went from tearing down the high places to all of a sudden settling in. Jehoshaphat's owning this, but Everyone has to take ownership of their own compromise. You can't blame your pastor or your parents or your spouse or your boss. You have to take ownership. Even though someone might have influence with you, you have responsibility and you have to own that, you see. We can't scapegoat like Adam did. Well, Lord, it's the woman you gave me. That doesn't work. If you want to be clean and holy and restored, you've got to own it without any pointing fingers at anybody else. Otherwise, it's not clean. There's not going to be true healing there, you see. But Jehoshaphat, he's, he's failed as a leader, but now he's going to come along and, yeah, he's going to call everyone. It says Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord and from all the cities of Judah, and they came to seek the Lord. Incredible. Here you have hundreds of thousands of people coming to seek the Lord. There was fear. There's too many of my beloved brothers and sisters who do not fear God or have any sort of fear or respect for the spiritual battle that we're in. That's ordained of the enemy. That's his plan. That's what he does. He wants to dupe us to the point where we have nothing to be concerned about. The Apostle Paul would beg to differ in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, right? He wants us to be aware of the spiritual battle, what's really going on. Man, Jesus said, go be sheep among what? Wolves. That's incredible. He wants us to be sheep that are at peace and at rest, but we recognize that there's wolves around and we need to follow after the shepherd or we can have problems. If you don't believe that, study church history. I wish it was just as easy as praying a prayer and we pray this prayer and everything is good for the rest of our Christian life, but that's not true. We have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, you see. We have to be a people that seek God with all of our heart. That's what he said in Jeremiah 29, with his promise of of freedom and deliverance from Babylon. Oh, you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart, right? All of your heart. Seeking God with all of your heart is... I got news for you. It's not just opening up your Bible or praying a quick prayer or, or getting up 10 minutes before you have to leave the house and go, oh, I'll listen to a Bible app for a little bit and I'll make a couple phone calls and I have my time with God. That's not seeking the Lord. It's not. You can do that and be saved, but it's a flaky salvation. It won't be something you'll walk steadfast, stable, and truly spiritual. You will not. You have to be a people, we have to be a people that seeks God in humility and daily saying, I'm going to pick up my cross, God, I'm going to die to self, and I realize that this flesh is constantly coming at me. What did Paul say as a believer, Romans 7? The things that that I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I keep doing them. There's this battle going on me. There's this king on my stomach that wants to get fed and it wants to be satisfied and it has ambitions and it has drive. It has goals that don't come from above but below. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. It's like there's hope and God puts us in this sort of a paradox in this battle that we're in because as we read this morning, He wants us to learn that the enemy is taken down, not so much by Joshua swinging his sword in the battlefield, but the Moses on the mountain holding the rod up in prayer and intercession. That's how the battle's won. Total humility, and it's all God, not us. Not by power, not by might, but by the Spirit of the living God. Any battle's won. Any oppression, enemy that comes around that willfully, it won't be because of our own power or might. It'll be because of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not attracted to any believer who wants to partner in the glory of God. 
Mm. Seek God. Are you seeking God? Are you seeking with all of your heart? I believe you. I believe you. I believe you're seeking him. And I want you to know the Lord sees you seeking him. Because his eyes search to and fro throughout the earth, looking for a heart that will completely be his. That's what you wanted when you were looking for a spouse, weren't you? The bridegroom of heaven is no different. A heart that's completely his, and a heart that's completely his, seeks him with all of their heart, you see. And that seeking is not always pleasant, it's painful. It's discouraging. It's times of praying where you don't feel. The God of your stomach says, I don't feel like he's listening. The God of your stomach says, I don't feel like he'll answer my prayer. He hears me, but I don't feel he'll answer my prayer. Kathy and I felt that as we laid there in bed early this morning, and I'm getting ready to leave, and we're going to pray, and she's honest, and I'm, I go through the same feelings. And I say, Lord, I want to ask that you heal me, but just sometimes it's hard to believe because you haven't. Haven't you ever felt that way? What do you do with that? You keep praying because there's a death that's going on in the midst of that valley of shadow death, Right? You're not the beginning of it where it's fresh. You're not the end where you see the hope. You're in the midst where you don't see where you came from or where you're going. All you have is what's been said to you. And when you start praying like that and that death goes on, a life is right around the corner, like a resurrection life is right around the corner. Hallelujah. You know, and God ordains all these things. And so seeking God is not for the faint of heart. Seeking God is pictured in the book of Acts of people that died as human candles. People that died sewed up in the skins of wild beasts by Emperor Nero, all because they would, wouldn't say Jesus is not the only way. They couldn't say that. They had to confess Jesus was the only way. They loved their king, and their God was not their stomach, was not their flesh, nor was it the things, achievements, or accomplishments, or possessions of this world. This world was not real to them. You see, because they were people who sought God with all of their heart. They were people who prayed throughout the day without ceasing, who fasted and carried their cross. They weren't caught up in the Western harlot. Verse 5, it says, Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand, is there not power and might that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in the temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and you will save. Do you hear the heart of this man of God? Did I say man of God? Yeah, because man and women of God will flirt with Ahab's and Jezebel's. Men of God like Elijah will go in a cave in doubt. Men of God like Abraham will lie and create an Ishmael. But God spared Jehoshaphat in his hunger and ambitions for the world because he was chosen and he was anointed. He belonged to God. And God showed him mercy. And that mercy crushed him in humiliation and compassion and a kindness led him into true repentance, you see. True repentance. And he made a public declaration. You want to dethrone the God of stomach in your life? Seek him. Seek him with tears. Seek him with pain. Seek him when it, it's, it makes no sense to seek him. Seek him. 
and then declare publicly his goodness. That's what I love about the public assembly. We have opportunity to publicly declare, God, you are good. Do you know there's something powerful in the spiritual realm that when you're in a public setting and you confess Jesus and his word with your mouth, that something happens in the spiritual realm? Don't you believe that? I believe that. Not only because Jesus says, if we confess him before men, he confesses before the Father. That one's good enough for me, by the way. But the text we looked at this morning, and if you weren't here, you can go online and listen to that 18-minute devotion. Yes, I taught for 18 minutes. It is a miracle. Incredible, right? It's the fasting. But we saw that, man, there was this physical expression that if it wasn't there, they were losing the battle, but with a physical physical obedience that does bring spiritual blessing. Did you hear that? It does. We believe in our, we confess with their mouth, we repent, and we're baptized. Physical obedience brings spiritual blessing. And when you declare out loud the goodness of God, like that. Something happens in the spiritual realm. Something breaks. When you have the opportunity for public worship, don't be one of those people doing this. Because chains are broken in praise. Believe that. Demonic oppression is vaporized in praise, mixed with repentance and the goodness of God, that though you should be dead and discarded and disqualified and removed from the vine, God has spared you. And when you get that and you're humbled and you're broken and you declare his covenant, you hear, he's declaring covenant, isn't he? We serve a covenant God, right? The covenant. He goes back to the covenant of Abraham. God, you promised He's not declaring the deliverance of God based on his works. He's declaring it based on God's promise. I love that. That's another Bible study right there. That's powerful. You want to dethrone the God of stomach? Seek the Lord with all of your heart. Fear God. Declare his goodness and his covenant publicly. Declare it and confess that you have no strength in of yourself. Do you believe that, saints of God? Look with me at verse 12. We'll move on a little bit here. There's a lot to cover. We can't cover all of it, but a few key points. He goes on to say, oh, our God, will you judge them For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. That's powerful. That is humility. I have no strength of my own God. I am not going to try and work my way out of this. I'm not going to try and lie my way out of this or bribe my way out of this or justify with Scripture my way out of this and not look at my own sin. I'm I'm not doing it. I'm going to prostrate myself before you wholly and completely, God, and confess that unless you show up, there is zero hope. Now, you know that you're in that place when you refuse to leave your house in the morning until you've touched the hem of his garment and he's made you whole. But if you leave your house and you enter into the mission field, the battlefield, outside of that kind of touch, that means there's confidence in the flesh. And I think we're all guilty in that area, aren't we? Every one of us. Some we have good days, some we have bad days. But you know what makes the bad day a good day? When God allows us to be surrounded by our enemies, it's the result of giving in to the God of our stomach. And he says, now it's a time for a reality check that you can't do this without me. You cannot. You know what God does for Jehoshaphat? He gives them, he gives them promise that he's going to show up, that he's going to bless them. It's worth reading, family. Verse 13, now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. And the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, and the son of Matna, 
a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, listen to you of Judah. Listen to all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. And you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook of the wilderness of Jerel. You will not need to fight in this battle. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. This is the king of Judah with his face in the dirt because the manifest presence of God is moving and he is humbled and broken. It says, And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohites and the children of the Kohathats stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with the voice loud and high. Did you hear that? Man, there was no mini mouse around. This was like they are shouting from the top of their lungs, God, you are good. God, you are good. We trust you. Verse 20, so they rose early in the morning and went out in the wilderness to Koa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, hear me, O Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets. And if you read chapters 17, 18, 19, you'll know he did not believe the prophets of God. God speaks to me direct. I don't need anyone else to talk to me. Listen to God's prophets. Listen to the elders and the spiritual coverings he's put in your life. Yes, compare everything to the word of God to see if it's sound. But don't despise prophecies or dishonor those who are God's anointed, who are sent to be shepherds of your soul. Jehoshaphat did. That's a warning. If you believe his prophets, you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness. They put on these priestly garments representing purity as they worship. And they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who had come against Judah and they were defeated. They went out to battle and found all their enemies laying in the battlefield dead. They never had to throw one spear or swing the sword once. You will not have to fight in this battle. The battle's the Lord's. You don't need the glory that you had something to do with it. See, this is why there's corruption in the move of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ with spiritual gifts. is because we long to be known as the prophet, known as the evangelist, instead of known as forgiven. You see, don't share the glory. The more you desire to give God all the glory, the more you'll see the power manifest in your life. How do we get there? Prayer and fasting. Not just fasting. This isn't a Jenny Craig deal, okay? This is seeking the face of God and getting rid of sinful weight in our life, lies in our mind about who God is and who we are in God, and drawing near to God and knowing the more we fast and say no, oh man, we're letting go of opportunities that the enemy sees to capitalize in our life, removing the cracks in our spiritual sidewalk. 
We're getting a keener ear to hear the Lord where we can go from being, man, a Jehoshaphat in chapters 18 and 19 to Jehoshaphat in chapter 20 who sees the power of God move. God bless Jehoshaphat. I want to be blessed, don't you? My prayer is that the next 24 hours that you would take ample time on your face to seek God. Get away with him. Get up crazy, stupid early in the morning, will you? Get up. Just wait upon him. Just wait. Wait like being a waiter or a waiter. I'm just here to serve you, Lord. I'm just here to serve you. I don't have to even read the Bible necessarily or have something to pray about. I'm just here to wait and listen to what you have to say to me and be available and allow thoughts to come in your mind that maybe you don't want to come in your mind because God's convicting you of something that's in the way of you and him. And he wants repentance. He wants holiness. He wants you to worship him in the battlefield in the beauty of holiness. With without, no one will see the Lord. Father, we give to you, Lord, this truth because we can't apply it without your grace. We can't receive the power to walk in true humility outside of a blessing from you. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to come. These next remaining 24 hours of this covenant we have with you, God, we ask God for twofold blessing. Lord, you've been blessing us, God. Increase the blessing. Increase our sensitivity to you. Reveal to us, Lord, the areas, the lies that we're holding on to, the things that are a hindrance in walking as Jesus walked. We thank you, God, that you are a God of mercy, that though we can covenant with an Ahab, you will spare our lives and grant us repentance to truly walk in your presence. In these last few days, hours that we have left on this earth, God, we desire to glorify you and you alone. So wherever there's rebellion to a husband that's justified, God, cleanse your daughter. Wherever there's a husband walking in indifference in his home and has given over the mantle of authority and leadership, Father, convict your son. Give him the courage to die in a way he never has before. Father, where there's shame over lusting over the life of Ahab and Jezebel, the hunger for sexuality that supersedes a hunger for your spirit, God, cleanse your temple. Cleanse your temple. The filthy images that we brought into our minds, Lord, by partnering and covenanting with a computer, God, cleanse your bride of these things in the name of Jesus. Deliver us, God. God, we have no power in of ourselves. And we recognize this is a battle, God, only you can win. So we lift up, God, the rod, believing, God, it's your power and your power alone that gives us victory. So, Lord, we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Baptize us afresh in your power. Give us an ear to hear our good shepherd and eyes to see the spiritual battle that you have authority over. Father, we pray these things in the name of Jesus. And every saint said... Amen. Family of God, stand to your feet, please. I'm going to release you in a few moments to find someone to pray with before you go. I'm asking you to take these things that you're hearing when you come to these meetings and take them to prayer. Not prayer for your friend, your spouse, your brother, your sister, for your own soul. May God take you into that secret place and bring an incredible crucifixion and a powerful resurrection to where you're never the same again. In Jesus' name. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning, tomorrow night. God bless you.